All right, stand with us, peace saving. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's ask him to meet with us tonight. And uh, let's, of course, ask him to uh, just inhabit the praises of his people. Lord, we love you tonight. We are so grateful for this midweek service that you allow us to have. God, I pray that you would always use it, uh, God, to be an encouragement. Thank you so much for the volunteers, uh, Lord, that are working in so many different places tonight. Lord, our nursery, God, our, our children's ministry or his kids, Lord, our, our teen ministry. Lord, so many people that are making contributions and eternal investments tonight. Lord, I, I pray that if there's a young person that's here tonight, Lord, that needs Jesus, Lord, I pray that tonight that Lord, you just send your Holy Spirit to prick their heart and to draw them to you. Lord, it's always a blessing to see a young person uh, come to know you at a young age. And Lord, I, I, there may be somebody in our congregation tonight, Lord, that needs you. Lord, I pray that uh, tonight, uh, Lord, that you would just draw them to yourself. Lord, ultimately, whether we're saved or not, Lord, we all need you. Lord, we all need you. So, Lord, tonight I pray that you would minister, up, minister to us. Uh, God, as we lift up our voices in song, God, I pray that we take just a moment. God, we reflect on every word that we're going to sing. And Lord, I pray that uh, our connection to you tonight, Lord, would be one, Lord, that would be intimate. Lord, one, Lord, that would just reflect what you've done for us and Lord, our submission to you. And Lord, we love you so much. Lord, we ask it always in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen and amen. Lift up your voices, church. Come into his presence.
think about this as you sing it. And there is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace. so much you know for being here tonight band thank you so much we we do have some logistics problems we're working through right now with uh, we have so many things that are going on at so many different times and um, you know just in uh, trying to solve these problems 
I'm going to have to ask you to be a little bit patient with me as we try some different things, and we are looking at possibly moving our Wednesday night service into our, um, into our youth room and kicking our youth out and setting up some stuff. We're trying to work on the logistics right now, and the reason being for that is because we do not have a time. We've got to get some rehearsal time for our worship teams and for our band and for whatever, and so uh, we're going to be taking everything out of the youth room and setting up chairs in there. We can get about 70 chairs in there, and that's typical. We typically have about 60, 65 people on Wednesday night, so we'll be working toward that. We'll see how that works out, but uh, y'all, if y'all will be patient with us, we are trying to work through that. Um, uh, you know, our, the back, the, the choir room back here is taken up with our kids on Wednesday night, and uh, we just have, you know, it's a good problem to have, you know, but we just need to uh, make, move some things around. So if y'all will help us with that, be patient with us. We still haven't made that decision final yet, but we are just kind of looking at that. And so if y'all will, if y'all will help us pray about that. Yes, ma'am. This youth room, we haven't built it yet. We are going to be under construction. No, it's over there in the administration. I know a lot of you don't even know what I'm talking about, but it's over there. But we, what we're taking, we're going to take all the instruments out, take everything that's extra out, and just open it wide open, you know, so that we can put seating in there. And, and it'll work out fine. I've done several classes in there and had 60-some people in there. You know, as we, some of y'all, well, you've actually been in there. So you, you didn't know that was the teen room, did you? you? Didn't you feel young when you walked in? Didn't you feel kind of vibrant, you know? So, uh, but anyway, we'll, uh, we'll be working toward that. And that'll open up the auditorium and give, give our, uh, our uh, band and our worship team uh, a, a slot to be able to practice because we're having a hard time getting all that together and having choir practice at the same time you know, on Sunday evening, so it's just a, uh, it's a logistics problem, so we're trying to work through that. But again, thank you for your patience, I appreciate it, and uh, we'll let you know as things go. Uh, right now, that's the best idea that we have. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, last week we looked at the mystery of godliness, the mystery of godliness, and we went through and we obviously could not solve every problem with God. Matter of fact, I, we solved very few problems with God. All we know is that He knows everything and we just need to trust Him, you know, at the end of the day. But we talked about, you know, just the, the microscopic attention of God, and then we talked about the telescopic attention of God. It's just amazing how that He has uh, just telescopic sovereignty and has microscopic sovereignty at the same time. And so we looked at the mystery of godliness, and of course, you know, uh, uh, that's, that's a subject we're going to study for the rest of our lives and throughout all eternity. Here's the mystery of lawlessness, though. Some of your translations are going to read, or King James translation will probably read, mystery of iniquity. Uh, mystery of lawlessness, other translations are going to read, but we're going to be looking at that tonight, the mystery of lawlessness. And again, this study that we're doing uh, on the mysteries of the Bible, there are a lot of mysteries in the Bible, but I'm talking about the ones specifically called a mystery. Like last week, we talked, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified uh, in the spirit, seen of angels, and so on and so forth. What we're looking at tonight is what's called the mystery of lawlessness. But before we do that, I just want to uh, remind you of something that many of you, if you've traveled any at all, if you've never left Yakin County, you're not going to have any idea what I'm even talking about right now. But some of you will remember a few years ago, an ad campaign that a guy in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, who had kept his, his name anonymous, but what he did is he came up with this great idea. And it was this, if you traveled through, what he was doing is he put up these huge billboards, and these billboards were messages from God. How many of you remember those? Anybody remember? Okay, uh, you know, I was trying to go over them yesterday, trying to think of the ones, you know, and you probably can think of ones that I haven't thought of, but I'm going to give you a few of the mis the, these, these messages. Number one, he said, let's meet at my house before the game. God, you know. He also said, what part of thou shalt not do you understand? That's a good one, isn't it? God. He says, we need to talk. How many of y'all know we need to talk? Anybody know that? All right. He said, keep using my name in vain. I'll make rush hour longer, <laughs> you know. He said, love the wedding. Here's good. Now invite me to the marriage. Mm. That love thy neighbor thing, I really meant that. With a road your own, get you to my place. Big bang, I love this one. Big bang theory, you got to be kidding. How many of y'all remember that? <laughs> you think it's hot here. <laughs> That's really not funny, but it got, and, and then of course, the, this one was my way is the highway. And those are the ones I could remember. I remember just, I used to do a lot of traveling, and as, as I drive through big cities, you know, there'd just be these, these black signs, and it would just have white writing, and that would be it. And then he would sign it, God. Now, of course, you know, God didn't write those. They were somewhat biblical. You know, God hasn't sent any progressive revelation down to whoever this man was that put these signs together. But I, I gave you all that just to kind of say this. There was a day when God did speak directly to men. There was a day when God did tell men exactly what he wanted them to write, and when he told them to write, 
he told them to write exactly what he told them. Now, they were allowed to write, obviously, within the realm of their own uh, uh, capability. And they were allowed to write, of course, with their own personality. You know, as you go through even the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will see Matthew and, Mark and Luke being highly educated. John did a really good job. Mark wasn't the greatest, but Mark is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. All of them were writing without error. All of them were writing what the, what the Catholics call ex cathedra. The reason I use that term is because ex cathedra means from the chair. And they, they attribute that characteristic or that trait or that, that, that possibility uh, only to the Pope. That if the Pope speaks ex cathedra, in other words, from the chair, that he is speaking without error. Let me, without error. Let me just share something with you. The Pope does not speak without error. Matter of fact, the Pope has had to apologize over the years for what other Popes have done and what other Popes have said. They do not speak without error. Ladies and gentlemen, the church is not the final authority. The Bible is the th final authority. The church says we're the final authority, and our, our administrators are the final authority, and our Pope is the ultimate authority, and so if he says it, then it must be a progressive revelation from God, and it's as good as inspired Scripture. I share this with you. No, it is not. From Genesis to Revelation is inspired Scripture. And we need to be aware of that. We need to understand that. Our Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Inspiration simply means this, God breathed. God breathed it. Just like God breathed life into Adam and Eve. You remember how our Bible tells us in Genesis how that God breathed into him, to Adam and Eve the breath of life and man became a living soul. He gave life to it. And our Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, it says this, it says uh, that, that the word of God is quick. In other words, it's living. How is the Bible living? Because God breathed it into life. When you open up your Bible, you are reading the living words of God. They're a life-giving. You know, and so we have to understand that when we say all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, it's God breathing life into the very words, into the very message that we are reading. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Our Bible also tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man. Our Bible tells us this, but holy men of God, here's how it works, Holy men of God spake or wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. All right, so here's what we understand about Scripture. Scripture is given by inspiration of God. God breathed it. He gave it to men. Men wrote it down. Now, the men were not inspired. The words were inspired. The, the, word, the words itself, that God, the message that God gave to them, that is what's inspired. The men were not inspired. They were fallible human beings just like me and you. But the words that they wrote, God used them. He superintended over them so that they would write exactly what he wanted to write and so today we in all confidence we can look at this bible and we can say that we know that it is absolute truth john 17 17 says sanctify them through your by your through your truth your word is truth jesus said that with, with his own mouth and so jesus confirms that now i say that because as we look at second thessalonians chapter 2 there's some question here Paul himself was one of these men that were superintended by the Holy Spirit. Paul wrote at least 13 books, possibly 14 if he wrote Hebrews, and all of those books are inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. Here's the problem, though, and we're going to see this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The problem was that sometimes back then a man would write a letter, and then what would happen is he would forge another's name. So he would write a letter as though it was from somebody else, and he would forge that person's name. And that, that is what has apparently occurred Sometime here in Thessalonica, because the church received a letter apparently signed, they thought, by Paul, and the letter pronounced that they were already going through the judgment. They were already going through the day of the Lord, when in fact they were not. Matter of fact, we're not. We're not even there yet. Paul had never written such a letter, but apparently somebody had written a letter and had sent it to Thessalonica. They had received the letter, and it had Paul's name on it in, in, to some degree, and so they assumed that it was from the Apostle Paul. So apparently his name had been forged on several occasions. Now I say that because of verses 1 and 2. Read it with me in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look what the Bible says. Now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is Paul writing. And this is him writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he is saying, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word, or by letter, as if, it was, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. 
what Paul is doing here is Paul is, is revealing to these people at the church of Thessalonica. He's letting them know. Now listen, hold on just a second. I know some of you have been misled. I know that some of you have been misinformed because you think that you have received a letter from me and I am telling you that this has not happened yet. You are not in the day of the Lord. Let me give you three things that he said not by. Number one, he says not by spirit. He said don't be shaken by spirit. In other words, a prophetic utterance. He then says by word. In other words, some teaching. And then thirdly, by letter, which is what he's talking about, a written appeal. He's saying, don't be shaken by false doctrine, by a false prophetic utterance, by a false teaching, by a false written epistle. He said, this is not going on. He said, it's, it's as the day of Christ that, that that judgment is at hand. The letter actually suggested that judgment was already upon them. Not Paul's letter here, but apparently he's referring to a letter that they had received. Paul said, don't be up in arms. Don't be worried. Don't be afraid. Don't be shaken. Do not be troubled. The letter you received is not true because it was not from me, Paul says. Later in, the, in this very letter, Paul authenticates his words by his signature, which he called a token or a sign. Just turn real quickly over, to, over and you may not even have to turn over, but chapter 3, verse 17. Look at what the Bible says. The salutation of Paul with my very own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write. And so Paul emphasizes that here in this, in this book for that reason. He's saying, you've received letters that I did not write. He said, so I'm going to give you the salutation here. Look what he says, the salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write. Now, an interesting tidbit about Paul, and I'll just give you this kind of FYI. Uh, you may want to write this down. Romans chapter 16, verse 22. The Bible gives us a little tidbit of interesting information. Paul would often use an amanuensis, and that is nothing more than a secretary. If you hear somebody say an amanuensis, that's all that means. It's just a big, long word, but, but typically theologians say it's an amanuensis. An amanuensis is nothing more than a secretary that actually pens letters. You remember the Apostle Paul, it's rumored that he had bad eyesight. And so it might very well be that he came to a point or was always at the point where he could not you know, necessarily write. And so what he would do from time to time is he would use a secretary. However, what Paul would do... Uh, by the way, the guy in Romans 16, 22, the guy's name's Tertius, and he, he claims, he says, I, Tertius, wrote this letter, but I'm writing, I'm, I'm taking dictation from Paul. So Tertius is taking dictation from Paul, but what Paul says is this. Paul says, now when Tertius is done, or whatever amanuensis or whatever secretary that he used was done, he would himself take that pen or that quill, and he would sign his own name to it. So Paul made it very easy to delineate between what and what is not genuine. He said, this is the way that I write he said, examine my signature. And again, on t at times he would use a secretary. Nothing wrong with that. But God was giving Paul's, Paul the words. Paul's dictating the words to Tertius. Tertius is writing those words down. But the reason this false letter was so disturbing to the church was that it indicated evidently that the day of Christ or the day of judgment had already come. That means, of course, that the Antichrist or the wicked lawless one of verse 8, and we'll read that in just a minute, was about to arrive on the scene and God's judgment was very soon to be manifested over all the earth. Now, as we all know, the tribulation will be a very chaotic, it'll be a very frightening, it'll be a very confusing time. And so the people at Thessalonica were convinced that they were already in the day of the Lord because some of those things were true. And by the way, some of those things are true now. We have chaos now, we have confusion now, we have uh, frightening things that are happening right now. And so these people in Thessalonica, they are thinking, okay, well, all, some of these things are happening, so we must already be in the, in the judgment day of the Lord. And so they were very frightened about this. They were being persecuted. They were being martyred. And then they receive a letter saying that all of this is so seemingly signed by the Apostle Paul. Think about this. You know about Nero. Nero was a horrible person. He was a very strong and wicked leader. He was an anti-Semite. And he kind of fit the bill for the Antichrist, you know. Here's the thing, you know, uh, about, uh, about Nero. You know, it wasn't so much that he was conquering through peace. We'll talk about that in a minute. But Paul writes here in verse 3. Watch what he says. He says in verse 3, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day, what day are we talking about? The day of the Lord. The day of judgment. So, so he says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed and he, he identifies him as the son of perdition. So what Paul says is this. Paul says, you know, whatever that letter read, if it said that you're already in the day of the Lord, you're already in the time of judgment, he says, you know, that's wrong. He says, the Lord Jesus Christ has not come back. You have not been left behind. 
and you are not in that day of the Lord's judgment as has been described in Scripture. He says this, he says there's two things that have to occur before that can occur. Number one, he says there has to be a mass falling away. In other words, there had to, has to be an apostasy as he calls it. You say, what is an apostasy? An apostasy will be a time when Bible doctrines are completely tossed aside. Preachers preach what people want to hear instead of preaching truth. Now, again, some of that's already going on. We already see that. Let me give you uh, some commentary on that. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Look what our Bible says. Paul says, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. This is what he says, though. He gives, he, this is in the imperative. He says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. He goes on to say, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. And so there, although that's going on right now, there will come a time when that will be going on completely. Go back up, up to... Um, uh, those two things, if you will, because the second thing that has to happen, number one, a falling away. Number two, the man of sin has to be revealed. Now, who is the man of sin? The son of perdition. Judas was called the son of perdition, but Judas is not the Antichrist. Judas is deceased. There will be an Antichrist, and the Bible describes him as a man of sin. He will be a charismatic individual who will come on the scene, and he will bring a false sense of peace to the world. If you were here when we were doing our Revelation study, do you remember the four horse riders? The four horse riders, remember the first one, was a, a man on a white horse and he came with a bow and no arrows. And we identified that man as the Antichrist. He comes with a bow conquering, but no arrows. He will conquer through peace. And so that will be one of the identifying factors of the Antichrist. He will not come on the scene as an evil man or he will not come across as an evil man. He will come across, he might even win a Nobel Peace Prize. He may be an individual that actually is rewarded. Uh, I, I was watching Obama. You remember when Obama got the Peace Prize for absolutely nothing? I had no idea still what he got it for, but he was awarded the, uh, the, the Nobel Peace Prize. And I'm thinking to myself, well, let's keep an eye on this guy. Here's why. Because he's a charismatic individual. You know, he's very drawing. He's very alluring. Now, I'm not saying he's the Antichrist. I'm, uh, he, by the way, he still could be. But it, it could be somebody else. I'm not making a prediction. It's going to be somebody like Barack Obama. It's going to be somebody that is able to speak well and to be able to communicate well and able to be, to be very alluring. Now, don't go out of here and say, Pastor John said that the Antichrist is Barack Obama. Please do not go out of here and say that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's going to be a personality like that. It's going to be a very likable, a very personable uh, person, you know, that comes on the scene. And he will conquer, not with war initially, he will conquer with peace. And so that's the kind of individual that's going to come on the scene. He's going to appear to have the answers to all of life's problems economically, politically, and even religiously. Verse 4, look what the Bible tells us in verse 4. Read it with me. Who opposes, this is a description of him. He opposes and he exalts himself above all that is called God or all that is worships so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Now, this actually portrays an actual event prophesied by Daniel the prophet. Let me give it to you from Daniel chapter 8. There's several passages I could give you. I'm just going to give you one tonight. But it kind of serves as a commentary as to what we just read. Our Bible says this, he, Antichrist, Daniel prophesied, he even exalted himself as high as the prince. Now you'll notice prince there is capitalized. That's talking about who? Jesus Christ. So he exalts himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. I'm not going to take a lot of time on this, because when we went through Revelation, we hit this pretty exhaustively. But that is exactly what the Antichrist is going to do. He's going to exalt himself as high as Jesus Christ, and then you know at the three-and-a-half-year mark of the tribulation, he's going into the temple, and he's going to set himself up as God. He's going to kick the Jews out of there, and they are going to flee to Petra. And then he's going to become as if he wasn't already, it's just going to be uh, revealed in a more dramatic way. He's going to become the enemies of God's people. He's always been the enemy of God. And so at the midway point, he's going to waltz into the temple, and just as Antiochus Epiphanes, as we talked about some time ago, did in about 165 B.C., he is going to desecrate God's holy temple. He's going to set himself up as God. And so look at verse 5, because Paul says, I've already told you all this. Verse 5, he says this, he says, do you not remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? This is what Paul's saying. Paul is saying, now listen to me, 
Uh, you've gotten a false letter. It, it uh, supposedly has my name on it. But let me remind you of something. This letter is in contradiction. It's in diametric opposition to what I have already told you. I'm not going to contradict myself. I've already told you. The day of the Lord is not going to come until there's a huge apostasy, until the man of sin is revealed. He's going to exalt himself above God. He's going to, and, and, and it goes on and describes, you know, uh, what he's going to do in terms of the temple. He doesn't go into great detail, but we have that from other places. And so look at verse 6. And now you know what is his restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness, there's the mystery, is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Now let's go back and read that one more time, okay? Verse 6, now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out out of the way so number there's two things here we need to look at because there's two things that are restraining right now holding back the evil in the world what are they there's a who and there is a what let's look at what what the what is i believe that the what that's being described here is the church because in verse six it says you know what withholdeth now in, in the greek this is neither male nor female it's neuter it's a force of restraining and so we ask ourselves the question, what is it? Well, the influence of God's people is the only thing holding evil back in the world right now. So we can only assume that the what is the Christian influence, and I believe more specifically, I believe this is a reference to the church itself. Do you remember what Matthew 16, 18 said? And I don't have it for you. I don't think. Matthew 16, 18 says this. Jesus says to Peter, he says, upon this rock. What rock? You know, upon what? Upon this truth, upon this rock, I will build my church. The truth of what Peter has said, thou art Peter, and upon this rock, the truth of what you've just spoken, that I am the Christ, the Son of God, upon this rock, I will build my church. And you remember what he said? He said, the gates of hell could not even prevail against it. The gates of hell cannot even prevail against the church. So what is, what is the what that Paul is referring to here that is restraining? Well, number one, the what, I believe, is the church. Now, we may not be predominant right now in our culture. But we are prevailing to some degree. We are influential to some degree in this world. We are making a difference in this world. Now you think about this. When the church is taken out of this world, man, what's this world going to be like? If the church is taken out of this world, then what in the world is the, what in the wor world, world going to be like? But it's not just the church. It's also the who. Who is the who? Well, verse 7. For the mystery. Some of you are saying it's a rock band. No. Well, verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So Paul is giving a description here. He's talking about when the day of the Lord is going to come. And he's saying, you know, right now there is a what that is restraining, but more specifically there is a who. And the who is the most important thing. This is in the masculine, referring to the one who was promised to be sent as a covenant. You remember in John chapter 14, where Jesus talked about how he had to go away so that the comforter, the paraclete is the, the actual word from the Greek, it's one that walks alongside. Literally, it's one that, as we understand theologically, it's the one that lives within us. And the Bible says he will never leave us comfortless. The Holy Spirit of God. So here's the thing. Now, here's what, here's what the Bible does not say. The Bible does not say he is taken out of the world. The Bible does say he is taken out of the way. He's not taken out of the world during this time period. Paul's very specific that this he, and by the way, it's capitalized in your Bible. It should, well, you're, I don't know if it is in the old King James or not. The new King James is capitalized in your Bible. And, and, and that represents a, a pronoun. And that pronoun is none other than the Holy Spirit of God. And Paul is describing here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he's proclaiming to these people this has not happened yet because this has not happened yet the what has not been taken out and for sure the who is not taken out of the way now the only way a person can be saved is by the holy spirit of god so we know if people are going to be saved during the time of the day of the lord the holy spirit has to be involved because the holy spirit is always involved when a person gets saved so the bible doesn't say he's taken out of the world it does say he's taken out of the way because during this time period, what happens is all hell breaks loose. When we were working through, tribu through, through the, uh, the seven years of tribulation and revelation, we are seeing things that are being restrained right now. 
We are seeing things that are being held back right now. But there will come a time when God says, go ahead and cut them loose. And we saw that all throughout Revelation. Things that are going to be going on that are not going on right now. So if the church is taken out of the, out of the world, if the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way, you can imagine the chaos that's going to break out. The Antichrist will be revealed and he'll be given reign and power on the earth. So verse 7 portrays the mystery of iniquity or portrays the mystery of lawlessness. The mystery is simply this. You say, Pastor John, what's the mystery? Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you what the mystery is. And when I tell you what the mystery is, you're going to say, I already knew that. This is the mystery. The mystery is that evil is the more popular choice of the people on earth, while at the same time, a holy and a righteous God is in complete control of the earth. Isn't that a mystery? I mean, how many of you have stopped and just looked around and said, how is it that God is sovereign and in control of everything that is going on, and yet it just seems like that everything that's going on is anti-godly? That's a mystery to me. Because I'm thinking to myself, how are you in control of this? Have you ever looked to heaven and said, how are you in control of this? Is this controlled chaos? It is. That's what it is. It's controlled chaos. The mystery is that God, who is a God of order, has allowed chaos to be predominant in the world. But let's be reminded, how did the chaos get here? Adam sinned. Adam's sin brought the chaos. God created a perfect world. God created a world of order. God created a world of righteousness. When Adam sinned, Adam brought the chaos. But here's the thing. Just because Adam sinned, that does not negate from God's sovereignty. Because our Bible tells us that, the, that, that Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world. God already knew it was going to happen. God had already predetermined in his mind and in his heart that he was going to allow his son Jesus to come to this world. And see, God, you say, how is, how is it possible that, the, that Jesus could be slain before the foundation of the world when it was 4,000 years or so in history beyond uh, creation that, that Jesus was actually slain? we got to be reminded of something. God is not limited to time. God is not limited to time. God created a series, and God exists outside the series. So when God says the whole, that Jesus Christ was slain before the foundation of the world, in his mind, in his heart, it already happened. Because he's not limited to time. You say, Pastor John, I don't understand that. That's why John Hoots is here tonight. He's going to explain it to you after the service. Meet him out in the, in the no, nah, he's not going to, and nobody else is going to, because they can't. Because we are limited with time. We are limited with space. We're limited with energy. We're limited with matter. Those are, things, those, are, those are the things, the components that are created by God. And we are limited by those things. And our thinking is going to be limited. It's just like a computer. Computers are programmed by people. And they can only go so far, you know. And, they're, and they can only, you know, do so much. They can do, now, here's the scary thing. They can do more than we can do now, it seems, you know. I mean, but, but the truth is, is that uh, they, there's only certain languages and certain things that they understand. There's, there's certain programs that they understand. They can't operate outside of what their creator has designed them to understand. God has designed us to understand time or space, matter, energy. Those things, we don't understand everything about it. I don't understand all that there is about quantum physics, but I do understand this. I understand that I'm limited and he is infinite. I'm finite in what I understand. He is infinite in what he understands. And so when we get to talking about some of these things that we, that we discuss, we have to realize that some things are just going to have to stay in God's realm. I do not understand why a Hurricane Katrina happens. I do not understand why an Oklahoma City bombing happens. I do not understand why a Columbine shooting happens. And I'm just thinking right now through my mind things that have happened. You know, I don't understand 9-11. I don't understand these things. But it's chaos. But according to our Bible, it's controlled chaos. That all of this is going to work together for good to accomplish the purposes of God. And when we start reading through Revelation, we, things get, we see things get worse worldwide. Right now, these are, these are in certain locales, certain proximities. During the tribulation, it's going to be worldwide. 
everybody's going to be undergoing all of this mess. In verse 8, look what our Bible says. Read it with me. And that, then the lawless one will be who, the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with his with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming uh, it's interesting in most of the antichrist passages he's never referred to as the antichrist when you read in Daniel about the antichrist Daniel never calls him the antichrist when you read in and you, you, uh, in Matthew 24, you know, we don't read anything about the Antichrist. When we read in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, it never says the Antichrist. When you read in Revelation, it never says the Antichrist. You say, where do we get that from? Well, that's what John calls uh, this individual, we believe, you know, the Antichrist. We believe that John, you know, gives us that name, and we believe that's the individual that he's talking about because he talks about a specific individual he refers to him as the Antichrist. And so we put that together and we believe that that is describing this one individual. And I think we do that uh, in an intelligent manner. So what, look what Paul says, though. Paul throws in a parenthetical statement of encouraging reminder. This is what he says, and I'm going to paraphrase. He says, who, by the way, will be crushed at Armageddon by Christ? Go back and read verse 8 again. And then the lawless one will be revealed. That's the man of sin, the son of perdition whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Or in other words, whom the Lord is going to crush at Armageddon. Verse 9. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Read it again. The coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist, the son of perdition, the man of sin, he is, it is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Our Bible lets us know he's going to perform what's going to appear to be miracles. And they'll be beyond human comprehension. By the way, do you remember from Jan Daniel chapter 9, do you remember the first thing that he's going to do? He's going to bring peace with Israel. Daniel chapter 9 tells us that there's going to be a peace treaty or a, a peace covenant that the Antichrist is going to sign with Israel. And here's the thing. In order for him to bring peace to Israel, he's got to bring peace around Israel. And when you have all of those Arab nations that hate Israel, this is going to be an amazing act, politically speaking. How in the world is he going to bring together those Arab nations that, that all they want to do is destroy this little country and take it over? All they wanted to do is destroy these people and take them over, annihilate them, obliterate them. And yet, the Antichrist is going to do what nobody else has been able to do, and that is bring peace between Israel and the Arab nations that surround. And so it's going to be an incredible thing. So when our Bible says he's got all power and signs and lying wonders, then we understand this is going to be an amazing thing. People are going to be standing back. They're going to be ooing. They're going to be eyeing, And they're going to say, here is the leader that we have needed all these years because he is able to do this amazing thing, politically speaking. Then look at verses 10 through 12. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And watch what God does here. All of these people that are buying in to what the Antichrist is selling. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. That they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. This is one of the saddest things I guess I've ever read. And again, it, this is a mystery to me itself. You know, over in Romans chapter 1, do you remember how Paul tells us that God gives people over to reprobate minds. The, the idea is this. It's that God has, in, in the chapter, you remember how it talks about how that uh, people begin worshiping the creation instead of the creator in Romans chapter 1? And that people start following after their own lusts. And then Paul gives this laundry list of just, uh, of just unrighteous and ungodly and wicked lusts that people have given themselves to. And finally, God says, okay, if that's what you want, I'll give you all of it you can stand. And the Bible says that he gives them over to a reprobate mind. Now, that's a, 
that's a very interesting thing to me and not, not really one that I totally understand. So you know, Some people have even preached this, and I'm, I'm not going to go as far as this because I don't know that, that we can be dogmatic about this, but some people have preached that, you know, people that have heard the truth and they have rejected the truth, that during the tribulation they have no opportunity to be saved at all. I'm not going to go that far because I don't think necessarily that we have been given that information. I've heard it preached for years, and I've heard it preached from that passage, but that passage is not dogmatically saying that. We don't have the time frame. We don't have reference points to be able to make uh, that assumption. However, it might be true. I don't know. I do know this. There will come a time, and I don't have a point of reference as to when that time is. But there might come a time. For sure, in Romans 1, there's a time when God gives people over to a reprobate mind. For sure, our Bible talks about even a sin unto death. Now, I believe that's talking about even right now during our time, but it will still be intact during this time. So there are certain things, you know, that we just cannot understand and do not know. One thing that we do know is this. If you've heard the truth and you've had opportunity to receive the truth, you better receive it. If you have had opportunity to be saved, today is the day of salvation. Do not put it off and do not wait. Because you do not know whether it be in this lifetime or it be during the day of the Lord. You do not know when the Holy Spirit of God will stop dealing with you. The Holy Spirit of God has to be dealing with you. And I do not know how God makes that determination. God is sovereign. God is, God is providential. God is all wise. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's immutable. He has all of those things figured out. And I don't understand all of that, and I'm not trying to. But I will say this. I don't need to understand that. What I need to understand is that God has sent His Son Jesus to die for me. He has extended salvation to me, and it is up to me to receive it. As we said, yes, <laughs> Sylvia, they're coming along. They're going to they're get better. I just know it. I know they're going to get better. We're coming along. We're not quite where you're at, but we're getting there. As I said on Sunday morning, endorse the check. He wrote the check. He made, he's got the money in the bank. He's already paid it. I have to endorse it. By endorsing it, I'm saying, I believe you died, I believe you were buried, I believe you rose again. Sometimes we get so caught up in all these things that we don't understand. And listen, here's what I understand. I understand that God doesn't expect me to understand everything. The secret things are for our Lord, Deuteronomy 29, 29, right? The secret things are for our Lord. There's some things God has not revealed totally, but he's given me enough to understand that he expects me, when I hear the truth, to receive the truth, to believe the truth, and to become a believer. You know, start, when you start nitpicking, and here, here's, here's how people do. We all have done it. How many of you, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, how many of you try to find loopholes when you're doing your taxes? How many of you ask your CPA, you know, to find every deduction, any loophole that you can find, you know, that'll save you a little bit of money? That's how human nature is. I'm not saying it's good or bad. It can be, can be good and can be bad. I believe you ought to find, how many of y'all believe this? Find every deduction you can. I'm finding them. Why is my hand, why are my hands the only one up? Now, as far as loopholes, that, that can get fuzzy. But you know how human nature is. You know what? Here's what I'll do. I'll just figure out, I'll kind of figure out when the best time to get saved is. What I'll do is I'll, I'll live like the devil and sow my wild oats, and then I'll figure out kind of when the best time to be saved is. You know, God knows how we think. He knows how we think. And I'm not, and I'm not suggesting that that's why he does what he does. But if he had spelled, if God told you when you was going to die, there'd be a lot of people out there, man, you'd have so many credit cards. You'd max your credit cards out, and, you know, you're not going to pay those credit cards. You're going to die, and your debt dies with it, you know, unless you've got somebody else, a co-signer. You know, God knows how we are. We just, the heart is deceitful, is it not? It's desperately wicked, and God knows that. But God gives us enough to know that he loves us, he's provided a way for us, and he expects us to trust him. And many of us, Sad to say, we're just looking for loopholes. We're just looking for a way, you know, to work the system. And there is no working God's system. 
there is no working God system. God is going to set in motion events of chaos and destruction that are going to go from bad to worse to unbearable. Armageddon will be the end, as described in verse 8, where God will, with the breath of his mouth and the brightness of his coming and his holy presence, he will annihilate the Antichrist and he will annihilate all evil in an instant. That's the plan. And here's the questions we ask ourselves. Number one, are we confident or are we confused about God's prophecy? Well, some of it is confusing. Some of it is confusing, and I'll be the first to tell you. As I was preaching through Daniel, preaching through Revelation, preaching through Matthew 24 and 25, even preaching through 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I don't understand all of this. Here's what I do understand, though. I do understand that we are depraved, and I do understand that he is the answer. And I do understand that he is coming back, and I understand he is going to right all wrongs, and he is going to defeat everyone that has rejected him. We can argue all day long. Is he, coming back, is he coming back before the tribulation? Is he coming in the middle of the tribulation? Is he coming after the tribulation? Is he, coming, is he doing the, uh, the Marvin Rosenthal thing and coming halfway through the, ha- the second halfway, you know? I mean, you know, there, everybody's got a theory as to when he's coming back. I personally believe he's coming back before the tribulation. I believe he's taking his church out of here. I believe the Holy Spirit's taken out of the way. And I believe that that's when all hell breaks loose. But it doesn't really matter when you believe he's coming back. Just believe he's coming back. He is coming back. And when he comes back, he is going to right all wrongs. And when he comes back, you better be on his team. That's what I understand. So that's what I'm not, I'm I'm confident of that very thing. I may not can dogmatically prove every other thing that I believe. Although I believe I can. But I may not be able to do that. But one thing I can prove is this. He is coming back according to the scriptures. And he is going to defeat every enemy. And he's going to receive every son and daughter. That's what I'm confident of. Number two, are we restrainers of evil? That's a good question. Are we restraining? I mentioned earlier, the Holy Spirit obviously is the restrainer, the he of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. But are, are we really operating in the what as the church? Does our life, does our witness, does our testimony, do those things really, are those things really restraining? Are we really saturating this culture with the gospel? I mean, that's a good question, and it's one that we need to answer. Are we really saturating this culture this society, are we really saturating our country with the gospel? Do you know how most churches gauge themselves? And, and you're, you're going to know that it's true when I say it. Most churches gauge themselves on the service they had last Sunday. We had a great service. Okay, but what did it do for your Monday? Most Christians live Sunday to Sunday. They really do. And they gauge their service on how well the music went, how well the preaching went, what the altar call was, how many people got saved during the service or whatever. And the truth is, that is not the barometer for a church. The barometer for a church is maybe what that service did to change Monday through Saturday. But see, we don't think of it that way. We think to the next Sunday. We plan for the next Sunday. Most churches put most of their effort into the service the next Sunday. Now, I don't mean to sound contradictory because I know we've talked about rehearsals and we've talked about planning and logistics and things like that. Well, they are necessary because you need to have a good service because when people come in, they need a good spiritual shot in the arm. But if that's where it ends, then that's not a healthy church. That is why you read through Revelation and you read all of those churches. And, and, and even the church at Sardis, think about it. What did, what, did, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, you look like that you're alive, but you're dead. Jesus was giving a post-mortem report on the church at Sardis because they looked like they were so alive and yet they were dead apparently they were having great services on sunday but their influence was obsolete on monday through saturday so to speak 
And so we ask this, ourselves this question, should our energy, should our greatest energy go to our services? Well, a, a great amount of energy should go to our services because that's when we kind of, you know, receive, you know, uh, uh, some, some good preaching, I hope, and some great singing and, and some great worship and some time to come together and some camaraderie and some fellowship. But our church has to be relevant on Monday. And so on Monday, are we restraining? On Tuesday, are we restraining? Are we saturating our culture with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Or are we just a church that has good services on Sunday? That's not the true barometer. It's not the true acid test. The acid test or the litmus test is what did we do in between services? Because it's easy to come in here and lift up the name of Jesus, but it's a little tough when you get out there. It's easy to come in here and promote the name of God, but it's a little tougher when you get out there. And most of the people that are sitting here tonight, if not all of the people that are sitting here tonight and on Sunday morning, have already bought in. What about the people who haven't? So number one, are we confident in prophecy? I believe we can be. Number two, are we restraining? Well, that's a question we're going to have to ask ourselves. And lastly, are we discerning? What I mean by that is, are we gullibly embracing everything that comes down the line, or have we studied the Word enough to know what is true and what is untrue? One thing that I determined to do when I came here to Peace Saving was this, to build a church that was making disciples, to build a church that could defend the Word. I don't know if I've accomplished that or not. If I have, it hasn't been because of me. It's been because of Him. But that was my goal. My goal was to teach the Bible, preach the Bible in a way where people could understand and in a way that people could apologetically defend it because I know the day is coming very soon, especially for our younger people. You would be probably surprised, and maybe, maybe you were even a subject of this, but you would probably be surprised at the how many believers have been saved for 20 and 30 years and do not even know how the Bible fits together. I mean, it, we say, oh, it's inspired, and this is the Word of God, and we're going to stand on this, and then a lot of people, they don't even know how it fits together. What my goal has been for the last almost 12 years, and I hope that to some degree I've accomplished this, and if I have, again, it's not because of me, it's because of Him, but I hope that you have a greater hunger for this book. I hope you have a greater understanding of this book. I hope that you can defend this book and defend our movement, defend our belief system better now than you could 12 years ago. If you'll stay in it and you'll study it and you'll make it a priority and you'll get hungry and you'll get thirsty and you'll become a self-feeder, you'll be amazed at what God will do with you when you walk out the door. And so don't let it be, well, we had a great service on Sunday. Let it be, I had a great Monday because I was able to share the gospel and I saturated our culture with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as we move forward, it's going to become more and more prevalent. It's going to become more and more necessary. It's going to become more and more, uh, you know, needful, you know. I hope, you know, that the prevalence here at our church is that the prevailing attitude would be, I'm hungry for the word. And I hope that it changes our county. I hope it changes our country. I hope it changes our world. There is a lawlessness that is right now saturating our culture. I pray that we as believers will oversaturate our country and our culture with the gospel. The gospel is the power of God to salvation. I'm going to do something on Sunday morning that I wasn't planning to do. I was planning to start our um, elder series out with, the, uh, out with the new, in with the old on Sunday. I'm going to postpone that a week, a week and here's why. Um, 2 Kings chapter 5, that story of Gehazi, Elisha's servant, I just couldn't get it off my mind the last couple of days. And so I think I'm going to finish up that part of the Elisha series. We're going to take a four-week break, and then we'll come back and pick up Elisha again because there's so many great things there. But I thought, you know, that Gehazi story, I think we need to look at that. And so I'm going to finish that up, Lord willing, on Sunday morning. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as our musicians come. Let's take a moment, though, as they're coming with our heads bowed. Just ask yourself this question. Number one, are you confident in the prophecy? Are you confident in the prophecy? 
that has been given? Do you believe Jesus is coming back? And are you confident that you have been saved, that you were born again, that you are a believer? Are you confident? Number two, are you a restrainer? Are you a person who lives out the gospel to the point that God is using you to saturate this world with the gospel? And then lastly, uh, are, are you gullible? Are you gullible? Are you embracing everything that comes down the line? Or do you understand the truth enough to know this is what the Bible says? This is what is right. This is what is wrong. This is what is true. This is what is not true. And let's, ladies and gentlemen, today keep those three things in mind. Be confident. Be confident in the prophecies that you've been given. Be a restrainer. Don't be gullible. Don't be gullible. Believe only what the Word has given us. Lord, thank you so much tonight. Lord, for your Word, for the truth of it. Lord, that we can bank on the prophecies that you've given us, Lord, the one that you have given us. Lord, that we can be a restrainer. God, if we are saturating this Word with the Gospel, Lord, lastly, Lord, that we would just be consistent. Lord, be consistent, not gullible, not buying into everything that comes down the line, but God, remaining true to what you've given us from Genesis to Revelation. God, help us to be strong. God, knowing that in the last days, prophets are going to come, false prophets. Lord, people are going to have itching ears. Lord, they're going to want to hear this, and they're going to want to hear this, and they're going to want to hear feel-good messages. And Lord, uh, the feel good, Lord, is just knowing that we have truth and that we have true salvation. So God, as we sing, Lord, I pray that we in our hearts, that we do fall down and we do lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. Let's stand together. Let's sing this song together. occupy till you come. We look forward to that day when we see you face to face. In the meantime, use us, Lord, to change this world. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you. You are sent. <laughs>